Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Shades of Entrepreneurship. This is your host, Mr. Gabriel Flores. Today, I'm here with Hugh. How are we doing? He's the uh, executive chairman and founder of DNA Behavioral International. Hugh. Uh, deli delighted to be here with you, Gabriel. Yeah, and me, me, we're actually talking. Hugh's calling in from uh, Atlanta, Georgia, hot Atlanta. I was actually out there earlier this year for a conference, uh, and we're talking about how actually beautiful and diverse, uh, and not only importantly, more importantly than that, but the food out there, how good it is. So, Hugh, how are we doing? Yeah, really good. Uh, I'm hot because I'm in hot Atlanta. <laughs> <laughs> As we were saying. So, Hugh, give us a little uh, introduction. Uh, please provide a little background. Who are you? And then, and then we'll get into your business. Yes. Yeah, so, probably the audience has uh, already figured out, Gabriel, that I'm not from Atlanta originally. I, 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 I uh, um, am from Sydney, Australia, is where, I, is where I was born. But I've lived in Atlanta. Uh, for the last 20 years or so, um, I think as you as you were alluding to before, Atlanta is sort of that hidden gem out there in the world that not many people realize actually how good a place it's to live. Um, certainly, you know, within the you know the confines of of the United States. Um, so you know, so I love it here. But I suppose I suppose we sort of want to get to how I got here, but. You know, my my career started as a uh, CPA. That's in in American terms, Australian terms, chartered accountant. I was a uh, an auditor, then became a tax specialist. I worked in Southeast Asia for four years in in that journey. But then, at around thirty years old, I decided that uh, corporate life, working in a big big accountancy firm, was not going to be for me. I was a bit of a caged up tiger and I needed to go out there and uh, do something, as I call it, on the street, which is really starting an entrepreneurial journey. The one thing I knew when I started was that I wanted to create some sort of business that gave people a very personalized experience in wealth management. And, you know, at, at, at the time, and I think it, it's, it's changed today, but we're still, we're still working on it. It was very one size fits all. Uh, and, you know, pushing a product at, at, at you, not really understanding you as a person. I think not dealing with the complexities of it very well. And so it was, you know, and I was always interested in money, investments, doing deals. So I thought, yep. That's what I would do. But I think as my boss said, when I was leaving Arthur Anderson, you know, in, 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 he said, Hugh, uh, you're leaving us, but you haven't really arrived at your new thing yet. And I think, you know, it was quite a poignant statement and, and that he made, a quite a good observation. I think he knew, yeah, I was ready to leave, although he didn't want me to, but I hadn't figured out what my real thing was. Um, and maybe, you know, and I, and I say that because I think I know that Gabriel, we're talking to, you know, entrepreneurs today, not everybody fully knows that when you, when, when you start the next thing. And so anyway, after a few months, I figured out that it would be a wealth management business. I went and got licensed. I also, at the time I, uh, I did an MBA and I did my diploma in financial planning. So I was, you know, I became pretty, I was pretty highly qualified. And, you know, my accounting experience was, was pretty good too. I started to meet people. I started to get clients and I built business up. But one day, about five years into it, four years into it, a friend of mine asked me, you, you know, you don't, well, she said, you don't seem really entirely happy with what you're doing. What are you really passionate about? And I said, I want to help people all over the world become financially self-empowered. And I realized pretty soon after that, 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 you know, the fact that I just said that out of my subconscious, never having thought about it like that before, I need to do some work on this. And so I went and thought about it, reflected on and knew that, okay, if I'm going to help people all over the world become financially self-empowered, this is not going to happen from running a wealth management business based in Sydney. It's a very local thing. Um, uh, still a good thing, but it's not, it's just not going to be it. And so I started, I started working on that. I looked at my day journal and here I had, lo and behold, been writing about 
human behavior for quite a few years, including when I was in the uh, uh, the CPA firm. And, and that's where I realized that what I was doing was creating customized experiences for people by figuring out who they were. I wasn't using a process. Um, and so I knew how to customize the language, the communication. I could figure out who could take tax risks, not take tax risks. Um, that's that sort of approach I was intuitively doing in the wealth management business. So I realized that this is about human behavior. And what I also noticed was that when people were under pressure, they would behave differently to when they were in a social socialized sort of setting. There was this behavioral flip going on. I needed to know what that was. And lo and behold, as soon as I got to that point, a, a woman came into my office one day to help me with um, some recruiting and, and well, that's what she thought she was coming in to see me about as, as on, on, on the referral from her son. But actually she was an industrial psychologist and we started talking about my ideas about human behavior and money. And the fact that uh, I thought people had this hardwired behavior deep down that didn't always show up on the surface. And that's what must be causing people to have this behavioral flip. Now, I wasn't getting that from reading it in books. I was not a trained psychologist. And she said, that is absolutely true. And here's how this works. When people are aged, up at, at that time, people are aged three years old, they are 85% hardwired. That is the true natural instinctive person. That's where the first reactions come from. And people can't really change that hard wiring very easily. You can look with consciousness, learn to adapt to different situations. You can't change it that easily, but you know, through your life, you have other experiences. They shape you a bit as well. I thought, ah, okay. So what I really need to be able to do, I said to Carol, what I need to be able to do is to scientifically measure what people's natural hardwired behavior is. And how's that going to affect how they, and understand how that affects how they deal with money. That took me on the journey of coming to America 40 times in four years, basically every month to validate a system uh, that we have today. And that was really the, you know, the genesis of the DNA behavior system and the business. I, and because I wasn't so passionate about wealth management that I sold that off and made this my day job um, to basically build a behavioral sciences business that measures people's talents, how they deal with money. And, you know, today we are a leader in the area of behavioral finance made practical, probably more to the point, you know, there have been lots of research studies on this area, but the research scientists have not taken the research to practicality in terms of how do you know this specifically for each person? That's what we do, man. That so, so here I am now talking. <laughs> yeah, and you know, I, I I'm gonna I'm gonna take a step back a little bit because yeah. one of the things you said that I think was very interesting, um, specifically was you knew you wanted you knew corporate America wasn't your thing or corporate industry wasn't your thing, and so you wanted to get into an entrepreneurial endeavor. Yeah, um, and then I think this is where a lot of entrepreneurs struggle as well, where they they feel stuck. They have the golden parachute to retirement, right? They got the four hundred one k employee match, all these things. And then one of the things you also mentioned is you went back to your journal, your daily journal, to get inspiration about. I know I want to start a business, I just don't know what I want to do and one of my core competencies. How did that transition? You know, going through that journal, when was that aha moment for you? It kind of sounds like, you know, reading through that journal, but what was it in that journal that really made you say, you know what, I think I should actually pivot away from this wealth management and focus on the behavioral health? Yeah, I, I think that if we just unravel that a little bit more, because you've, you've cottoned on to some of the, the, the big point. I think the first thing was that I realized in, that when I was in the in the large corporation, if you want to call it that, in the corporate life, that I was a bit of a caged up tiger and that I I think I I was not passionate, I was not as passionate about the tax work that I was doing as perhaps I should be 
and I wasn't loving the environment. And, you know, I think that it's easy to say, oh, is that the, is that the firm's fault? No, it was Hugh developing and growing and becoming, you know, if you want to call it the man I am or am, am supposed to be to become, my identity was growing. And so I always like to look at it that, you know, I had a great experience where I was, but maybe it wasn't right for me for the next stage of my life. And and now I know more about my behavioural style. I can absolutely see why. I, I, I'm pretty strong on risk-taking, fairly single-minded, uh, et cetera. Could, maybe with more coaching and development could have been made to work for me being there. Yes, maybe. But I think, I, as I said to somebody on the golf course the other day, I probably would have left anyway at some later point. It, it would have got too much for me. So I think that temperament-wise, I was ready to go. What I hadn't figured out is what to do. And, and but I was lucky enough I was not married. I, I you know, I had uh, some money of my own that I was able to, you know, withstand, if you want to call it being hungry for a little bit, uh, or I was not going to be hungry if I didn't make everything work day one, right? Whereas some people have got a family, they've got debt, and they've got to make their entrepreneurial venture work inside three months or their toast. I, I wasn't in that place. And that was also a point of leaving. I think that if I still it back, I've always said to people that being able to have my freedom was a reason to be in was a was a reason to be an entrepreneur and 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 that it, it does provide you provide you with freedom and no one's going to fire me, right? Um so there's lots uh that's a, I think that was the big reason. It wasn't about, well, I can just make more money in doing something else. It was about my freedom. It was about building my own identity. I started the wealth management business because that's something I knew I would be good at from a competency point of view. Uh, the tax experience is something that's relevant for all of that. I was good at consulting with clients. But you're right, is that when, where, where the real switch came to the venture that I have today came from looking at the day journal, taking all the notes and getting very specific around the fact that I had been looking at behavioral systems, human behavior, writing notes about it. What, what I thought worked out there didn't work, what I didn't like about other approaches. I'd been documenting that. And then I'd looked at what I had in effect practically been doing in my accounting career and even in the early stages of the wealth management career. And I realized that's, this is what I am good at. And this is how I can help build, do something for millions or billion. Now I would say billions of people, but millions of people, I could do it on a big, you know, on a very wide scale globally. Cause it would be something that would become technologically driven technology was not as advanced then, but it was something that I could I, I could do. So I think that's the the point. But the I think where you're going, Gabriel, is that the makings of this was very there very early on. Yes, yes. Customized it, customized experiences to create a customized experience for the person. You absolutely need to know who they are at a pinpointed level. Yeah. It's not it's not a guessing game. I, I started off with it guessing, which is what a lot of people think they can do, but really at scale, you need to it needs to be more measured than that. Yeah, and I think you brought up a great point in in regards to, you know, understanding yourself, not only your customers, but understanding yourself as well is really important. Understanding yeah core competencies. Cause it sounds like, you know, you went with your core competencies with, you know, wealth management, but that wasn't your passion. Right. You, you're, you have a core competency, but it wasn't your passion. No. Uh, and so that's one thing I'd always encourage folks to think about, you know, there are a lot of things you probably do on a day to day basis. That is your core competency that you actually enjoy. You know, you, you, it becomes that the golden hour, right? That moment where you're doing a task and you actually forget about what the time is because you're actually enjoying the thing that you're doing. So time just kind of goes by right now with that said, you need to find a way to monetize that because there are tasks. There's a lot of tasks that I do on a daily basis that I absolutely hate, right? And I would love to automate it or or have someone else do it for me, right? Outsource it. And, and identifying what that value is to other people, what your core, how your core competency can provide value to someone else, 
Uh, and then if you have a passion for it, you can begin to see you can actually have a business model. And one thing I'll tell everybody, you know, before you do write a business plan, get a minimal viable product out there and see if people are willing to purchase it. If somebody is actually willing to reach into their back pocket, pull out their wallet and purchase the item or service that you're providing and you enjoy it, okay, now you have a business. Now you can begin to write a business plan. And, and you know, to his point, now you can begin to scale it because now you're, because then you kind of dive deeper into it. You start to learn about your customer flow. You start to learn about customer acquisitions. You start to learn about your SEO to bring drive people to your website, but you don't want to go down that rabbit hole until you have an, a minimal viable product, right? Something yeah, I think that. Them. Yeah, I think that's right. I think that there's Gabriel. A lot of things that we all can be eight out of ten at. Um, you want to find the one thing you can be ten out of ten at. Very true. Uh, what's the business model around that? And 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 as you say, by building a minimal viable product, you start to figure out whether you even like that business, right? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I think there's two sides to it. You are pointing out, well, do the clients and people will they buy into it? But do you actually want to do it? Right. Very true. And, and and I think that, you know, one of the points for entrepreneurs here is that, you know, once you're at that stage of MVP or minimum viable product, you know, I call that business plan A, you are probably not going to get to traction with something yeah. you really love that can can really grow and be successful to you about at about business plan G. Yeah, very, very true. Very true. And, and there's a lot, there's a lot of iterations and variations and and in a way you 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 develop as well as the entrepreneur Correct. as you're going through that uh um um you know as as you're going through those cycles of getting to that place and you know i've been at, at it now for 20 years or so with dna behavior even last year we went through a really big process around you know 10x exponential growth is better than 2x optimization and and you know in some ways yeah we could have looked at our model and just continued to perfect it a bit more fine-tune things but if we really want to go for it what do we strip out and allow ourselves to go 10x and what does that look like and how do we do it and 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 the the principle being if you've got the courage to do that the 10x can be easier. And, and so we stripped away things, changed things. And, and in fact, we've, we did that and then we've done it again. And sort of we're in a way we're on the 100x. And, and you know, I, I, but I think that that all comes from getting clarity, working out what you really love to do um, yourselves. Uh, are, are they there, the clients to do it? Um, but we could have, I suppose what I'm trying to say is that we could have kept on a path of doing, you know, providing a service that, you know, that we like and enjoy, but actually it's not, and the clients are prepared to pay for it, but there's actually more out there to be done, right? Yeah. Yeah. If you're not getting comparatively better, you're getting competitively worse. So it's, it's always important to kind of continue to look at where you can pivot. Now, this next question I'm going to ask you is a, yeah. a bit of a two part question. Cause one of the things you mentioned, you know, you're, you know, DNA behavioral is now kind of a, a industry leader, right. In, in your field. So the next, this is a two part question. So one, what has been the key factors in your business success? And then based off of your business and all the information that you have now obtained, what are the key factors that pull people back and their own life and business? Yeah, so I, I think that that's a, a, a good point. I, I think one is always, we've always kept, we've always held true to, you know, our values and what we've, what we believe, you know, so that we've always wanted to, you know, in terms of this self-empowerment, help people optimize their lives, financial success, business life, from knowing their talents, knowing their financial behaviors, the hard wiring. We've never bent on that, never bent on the methodologies. Uh, I think that, but we've always been prepared to be adaptable, to make changes in, in, in the business model as needed or to adapt to a client. You know, we've worked on customizing our solutions and the way things get delivered to to meet varying client needs and and have always worked with with differentiation you know you talked about being a market leader you know yes there's lots of personality systems out there 
but really we're the only one that is 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 standalone out there on on how you deal with money and that's been proven over and over again even you know working with a large consultancy firm the last few weeks that have bought our solution at the enterprise level it was because of the fact that we deal with money uh, gets us there but we're also dealing with other behaviors too so we've become a very interesting package for for organizations but i think that's the uh, the thing we've always been you know fair with clients i think that's something that's important you know that being fair transparent uh very reliable so you know meeting our own core values has been something that's important and 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 i think the other thing that we've that we've done with this is i've now put words around it psychological safety that when when i always said that if somebody is going to use our system with a client particularly but even with other employees you've got to be prepared to go through it yourself and show who you are and if you're not prepared as a leader as a financial advisor consultant whoever it is to be transparent about yourself then don't use it and I think that's a different level of leadership when you're prepared to do that, because if you're not prepared to put yourself out there and be open about who you are and have open conversations, be approachable, then not much is going to happen. And, and you know, I always wanted psychological safety with, with what we do, not manipulation or people playing a game. And we've held true to all those things all the way along. Uh, one of the things you mentioned was was leaders, leadership. Yeah. How do how do leaders, how do their financial behavior impact an organization that they lead? Very good. Very good question. Um, you know, that if I if I start this way and say that, you know, we've all as leaders, we've all, or for any leader, you've got a behavioral style. That's that's wired into you comes with that you've got a you've got an inherent perspective about money inherent motivations that are uh, um, wrapped up with with money you've got a drive to to make it save it um, innovate with it have experiences whatever money is there in every decision you make it's there in every waking uh, wake wake waking moment and sleeping moment and therefore, every decision you make in the company, the culture that you set comes with it, you know, is, is going, comes with it is your attitude to money or, or it will reflect or mirror your, your attitude to money. Um, optics, you know, you know, every, every person can look at a situation differently. You know, you can look at an expense. Did somebody, you know, did your head, head of sales go and entertain a group of people you know and, and one person will look at it as lavish and the other another and, and that and why did we do that and spend all that money and another person will look at the sales number that came in because of it and say that was a good thing to do or we've innovated a new product that's now uh moves us apart in the market you know from a from a good perspective but it cost us quite a lot of money is that a good thing or a bad thing you know but but money is wrapped up in all of that and it, and it, and it goes in you know how you as a leader stand up and handle money is then going to re be reflected in how you handle the reports below you and all the way through the organization. And I think you can see it, you know, particularly with some of the, uh, you know, Boeing, um, the aircraft company is a great oh, example. Very great example. Of financial behavior. Boeing built its reputation on being um, a safety first company building Very true. the best aeroplanes that were safe in the sky. Uh, and then they did a merger deal with McDonnell Douglas. The Boeing leadership was there for about a year. A year later, the McDonnell Douglas leadership cleaned house, cleaned house moved aside the, uh, the, the, the staid, boring Boeing people that it was safety first. And it became all about results and numbers and financial behaviors. And then the culture changed. And then when people started to raise it, corners got cut on safety issues, people, people lower down raised 
concerns. They get fired. There's manipulation with the uh, um, the regulatory authorities, blah, blah, blah. And now we've got planes falling out of the sky. And I don't think there's a day where Boeing gets good press. And it's a disaster. It really is. And yeah. it's very sad. And frankly, it's quite scary in a lot of ways. I don't do as much flying as I once did, but it's quite scary getting on some of the airplanes now wondering, well, gee, am I going to be on the plane where the where the door falls out or the, the you know, ABCD happens. Yeah, that's very true. And it's, it's funny you mentioned that because, you know, Boeing, I'm here in the Pacific Northwest. Boeing is a big Washington company. Uh, Alaska Airlines, you mentioned the door falling yeah. off. That happened actually right over my home. Uh, we actually got a notice to look around our home for debris that fell out of that plane that that with the door came open. Because, uh, you know, you know, one thing I will tell the entrepreneurs um, and, and, you know, you brought up a great point, you know, once, once Boeing kind of sold off, uh, they kind of lost their, their, their kind of true North essentially. Uh, and that's true also for smaller businesses and entrepreneurs. Yeah. If you're going, if you're going for funding for venture capitalists, uh, you're essentially selling your business to someone else. Uh, and, and once they kind of come in, they may begin to dictate uh, you know, who is on the board, who who runs the business, uh, and then their core competencies, right, your mission statement may begin to fall to the wayside. Because again, their goal is not to, you know, scale your business to make people happy. Their goal is to scale their business to make the shareholders happy. Uh, and the best way to make shareholders happy is make money. Yeah. And I think that, you know, the, that given that, that many uh, uh, Startup, smaller businesses at some point take on outside capital of some of some sort. The type of capital you take on and the terms of it can very much shape the business. And I I, I think a lot of people take on, you know, the formalized venture capital, private equity, probably too early in their journey, and they're not ready to manage it and don't understand that in actual fact it's glorified debt. Because those, those those lenders, and I've been on I've been on that side of it too, want their money back. And, and, and so you've got to understand what that's going to do to the business. Are you the type of leader that can actually handle it? And I think the other side that I've talked a lot about as well is, you know, from a financial behavior perspective, is the investor, the VC investor doesn't always know who they are investing in. They think they do. They've had an They've been inspired by this person and gee, they've got a great business now. It's in artificial intelligence or doing something in health. You know, we better get in there. And they push the money at the person. But not only that, not only is the business model not ready for it, uh, neither is the the human being receiving it. And they don't they don't realize that this person might be, yeah, they might be a gun salesperson, but they're not really capable of running. A business beyond a few million dollars of revenue, right? Because it's not them, and and then it's not saying that they're a bad person. Maybe they they should still have a a very key role in the business, but it'd be different. And I think I think there there, there is a you know one of the things I've been addressing is there's a lack of transparency all around um, there on both sides of the fence. And and but this process could be a whole lot better for everybody if done through you know, people first and understanding what are the financial behaviors that are there. Um, so, and, and, and this happens at the private equity level as well, where, you know, they're very sophisticated, you know, businesses are bigger, but they're pretty sophisticated deals. The CEO and founder might've done a great job to get the business to the level of private equity, but are they the right person to handle the investors and the, and the investment money and, and really make it work. Um, a lot of the case, it's no. And, and, and you see that written up all the time. You see the results of it. And it is about people. Yeah. You know, Hugh, I think this is a great time to actually plug the nonprofit. I actually started a nonprofit, Latino Founders. Uh, again, folks, you can go out and in your community and find a lot of nonprofits that will help support the, the scale of entrepreneurship. We actually have a free business accelerator program. We actually had 33 applicants this year, some from Paul Alto, from Illinois, from New York. So we had a pretty diverse group of individuals applying. And the goal behind this is to really create a 12-week immersive business accelerator program 
that's very business agnostic. So we can really talk about all these different operations, financing, scaling, marketing, very uh, organically. Uh, but then we'll set you up with a mentor. We set you up with a mentor to really help talk about scaling your business, uh, what things work, what things do not work. But the best part about it is actually our pitch competition. So we actually have a pitch Latino competition and we have you, the entrepreneur, come and pitch your business idea to the community. We had last year about 250, 300 guests. Those attendees will then vote live right then and there on who they believe the winner is. And then the winner actually receives grant funding. So as, as you know, he was mentioning, venture capital is basically a glorified loan. Grant funding, that's not a loan. You get that money. You do with what you need to it. You can put it towards marketing. You can put it toward your sales. But the beautiful thing about the pitch as well is you're going to get insight because we have VCs that attend. So you're going to get live insight from them as well to kind of let you know, hey, you're kind of going down the right path or it might be time to pivot. Yeah, and I'd love it if 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 in 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 the not for in the not for profit environment you're talking about Gabriel, perhaps that uh, we get a DNA discovery done on every person that's uh, seeking a grant, and that will provide an extra layer of insight for the person's giving the grant. Because why what you know do you want to give the grant to somebody that yeah they might have they might have talked a good game, but they're not going to be able to really do it, uh, or as you say. You know, they've done a great presentation, great idea. The the person giving the grant wants to be involved, but the person's going to need coaching and who do they bring on their team? This will soon tell you that. And and I think it would be, you know, that would be, you know, something I'm prepared to to offer today, um, you know, for you and, and for anybody listening. Why not know this and know yeah. the truth and make decisions around the truth? It, 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 it will it will save a whole lot of trouble later on. I love it. I love it. We'll definitely connect a little bit more, discuss that a little bit more after this show to definitely connect, build that relationship. Because I think, again, yeah. a knowledge is power, right? Now, you've worked with, you know, we're talking to entrepreneurs. We have a lot of entrepreneurs listening. What would you say is one of the most common financial errors that either businesses or entrepreneurs make that you have noticed during your uh, work experience? Yeah, so so from a financial decision making point of view, I think that um, probably well, I know what the I know what the winning stroke is. Is you know it's it's around how you invest in innovation, and I think that at the end of the day, you could spend too much money on innovation. You do need to innovate and innovate regularly, particularly in today's dynamic world with with AI. But I think it can be done with a lot lower cost and get, as you said, get MVPs into the market at, at lower cost. I think that a lot of entrepreneurs spend too much money on the wrong things. You know, they spend too much money on the wrong people. You don't have to pay as much in, in this in the environment for people as I think as you as you think you do. There's the gig economy out there. There's lot, you know, offices, there's uh, you know, the way you travel, the way you eat and live. I think that they're all things that that can become a threat to the business and, and you know you need you need to be able to run a relatively tight ship but be smart as well you do need to make strategic strategic investments but i think that there's too much spending on the wrong things in 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 some of those areas i agree i agree now now on your business dna behavioral how do you help individuals and groups improve their decision making yeah, so so the first the first thing that 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 we you know we do it at a number of levels. Of course, you know improving your decision making firstly comes down to knowing who you are and what your strengths are, but also on the other side, what your struggles and what the biases that you might that you might have are. I think that also everybody talks about your intuition being very powerful. And people say, well, my gut says I'm to do X. And I absolutely think you're in, that the intuition is powerful, but it's got to be tuned first. And I think that in making decisions, you should get more data points before you use your intuition. In fact, the data points will help you make the intuitive decision. In its rawest sense, 
intuition is only 28% accurate, you know, if that's just your initial reaction. I think that getting more data points, check yourself before you wreck yourself will help a lot. But I don't want anyone to hear this to say that your intuition isn't powerful. It is. I absolutely rely on mine. Um, and it's very, you know, relatively very tuned. But I also look for data points. I think being patient is important because you don't know, uh, you know, with your intuition, the timing of things. It might be a little off certain days, you know, you, you just got to be very careful with that, depending on how you interpret intuition. So I think it's a balance. Uh, Gabriel is, 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 you know, is what I would, is what I would be saying, but also, you know, if, if you're sitting around the table with a group of people understand at the table, who's the authority bias there, who's just going to say yes, because um, that's the easiest thing to do and then duck their head who's extremely anchored. So understanding who's around the table with you, who's got to be uh, persuaded the right way, uh, not manipulated, but persuaded the right way, I think is important. Getting people to, um, you know, come up with their own decisions and, and, and from their experiences, data points is important. So laying the table for the decision-making process is really important. Yeah, yeah, very true. And and that's, I think that's true. Also, when you know, folks are identifying employees to work for your business as well, you know, making sure you have the right people on the bus. I always say there's, there's three types of employees, right? There's an engaged employee, everybody knows the engaged employee, right? It's a person that comes to work does shows up, you know, does everything they've been asking, even sometimes more. And then you have the RIP and the cave employee. Now the RIP employee is, is the retired in place. Right. They come to work, they kind of do the bare minimum. They just they're just looking for retirement. They're just there. And I'm I'm okay with the RIP because I know I can get them to become an engaged employee, to your point, just making sure uh kind of leading them in the right direction. Now, the one person is very difficult is the cave employee. That they're constantly against virtually everything. The food sucks, the parking's horrible. I don't like the my boss. Those people are difficult because when you hire a new member of your team. It's that cave employee that's going to be training them. And what are they going to be training them? How bad the food sucks, how bad the parking is, how, yeah. how much they hate their boss. So making sure you get the right people on the bus is, is just as important. And they have to believe in your mission as well, right? When you craft a mission statement, it shouldn't just be a statement, but it should be also be a goal. Right. What, what are you trying to accomplish with this? You know, Nike, everybody's an athlete. OK, well, they want to accomplish the feeling that every individual that puts on an article of their clothing feels like an athlete. Right. That's it's not just a mission statement. It's a, it's a goal. Yeah, I think that the, absolutely the company itself has got to have a very engaging culture, which is what you're referring to. They've got to have a very clear goal. And then all the roles have to be clearly defined. Now, of course, that changes as the business grows and develops. But, but the more clarity you can provide people of what's expected of them, that all helps the way the leaders then show up each day uh, is important. You know, if you're the leader and you get emotional or you rough handle people, you, it's not going to last very long and you don't, there's not much forgiveness, really. Um got the wrong 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 teddy bear down there you know in in the ranks who's not who's not properly engaged they'll put they can poison it for everybody and you can't have that and you know yeah. some people start off as being the right person but as life goes along or the business goes along it's not right then you need to you know you need to be uh uh working on that and but I think one, you know, one thing that's got clearer for me about all of this is, you know, while we are very big at DNA on and helping others do it is, you know, what are the talents required for a role and then ensuring the person's got the right talents and passions. That's all, that's all important. Values are important. And, you know, the organization can have its set of values and be clear about that. And the employee can come to the table with their set of values. But if they're clear about their values and they know who they are, I don't think you can sit there as the employer and say, I'm going to get them to change those values. That's either a fit or it's not a fit. Correct. Correct. And they could be the best person in the world, but actually their values aren't. And what's important to them is not a fit with your business. 
and 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 that's something to figure out yep. as early as you can. Yeah, I completely agree. And you shouldn't expect them to change their values, actually. Yeah. And 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 you know, I would also encourage don't set yourself up or your employees up for failure. Uh, and the best way to yeah. minimize and mitigate this is operational planning. You know, folks, I, I got to tell you, I think one of the difficulties of being an entrepreneur is actually letting go, to be honest with you. Uh, you built something, uh, we work, you know, I'm down in this basement 12 hours a day sometimes, you know, grinding it out. And set, uh, there's so many operational things that I don't want to let go because I created this this essence of, okay, this is my this is my quality standard. This is how I like to do things. However, if you create an operational playbook, you can begin to let things go because now it's operationally sound and you say, hey, if this issue pops up, this is what I want to resolve. If this issue pops up, this is how you resolve it. You know, and, and, and making sure that when you're starting your organization, uh, having those in place is very key because when you do, if you decide to go VC or if you decide to sell your company one day, not only are they going to look at your financials, but they're going to look at your operations as well. How well yeah. is this business operating? Because uh, that's also a big thing of financial loss if it's if it's done incorrectly. Absolutely, absolutely, and you got to have the right people there in your team to to do that. Particularly if you're the founder. Yep. Yep. Now you've, you've, you've written a lot of books and folks, for those that I'm going to have a list of these books on the shades of entrepreneurship newsletter, great opportunity to plug the newsletter, visit the shades of e.com to sign up for this newsletter, uh, leadership, behavioral DNA, financial DNA, business DNA. So these are all eBooks and I'll have them on the website. But one of the things that I really thought that really resonated with me that you do is you actually mentor boys without fathers. Now tell yes. us about that program and why is it so important to you? Well, it's 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 important to me because for a couple of reasons. One is I was a boy without a father. My father died <laughs> when I was one. Uh, wow. You know, I've had, I've had a but I've had a a great life. Uh, my mother did a fantastic job for me, and and in fact, my while I was one years old, my brother was not quite born when when my father died. Um, and so, you know, that's that's a very whichever way you want to look at it, it's a very shaping life event. It's one that I am uh, grateful for, although I, of course, would have wished I had a father. I, yeah. I think, and the way I talk to people about this is not to be the victim, but to be the victor. And to understand, and, and so what I, but what I learned on my life journey, a little bit from my mother, but also working with some some of our clients, I did, six podcasts we do behavioral identity podcasts with people and you know gabriel you could you could do it with me as well if you like i'll reverse the tables but i did six in a row with our clients about two years ago and they were all a boy without a father and I, and and one of them had done a doctorate in the in the traumatic impacts of it and there are a number around obesity social skills talking later depending on when it happens you know the earlier it happens the the bigger these issues are but also aggression and violence uh abcd and as a boy without a dad you can get yourself into a lot of trouble pretty quickly by the time you're 12 but also just have life challenges and so we all agreed after that that we would do something about this so i pushed the barrow to set up the charity boys without fathers so that we could help other boys uh it's a big issue out there in, in in terms of the you know what these boys if they're not helped go and do or don't do or what's wrong uh so that's it's a big societal issue it's a it obviously is a, a big issue for the families and it's not saying that the girls aren't important in, in it but what but the but the issues for the girls are very different and perhaps uh, have different societal impacts. And I can't talk to about the 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 um, the impact on a girl. One, I didn't have a sister. Um, I'm not a girl, and 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 I know how big this issue is for boys. But I think it is it is really an issue for the families, and it's an issue for everyone. And so we are doing this work as well. You know, for really any family where where there's been a loss of a parent, there is a traumatic impact. But for boys, it's big. Yeah, yeah, and you know, folks, I think this is a good opportunity to 
you remind folks to, you know, not judge every book by its color. There's a lot of things that our people are going through that we do not see. And yeah. I think too often in society, we have our iPhones and our, you know, or have our headphones in walking around and take a moment to look up from what you're doing and, and look at people and, and smile. Uh, you'd be surprised how that small smile would impact someone's day dramatically. Yeah. You know, um, the, the last thing we can do is, is wake up every day, go to our closet, pick out the ugliest outfit, and then blame the world for what we look like, right? We, we have to understand that everybody's going through something. Nobody's problem's bigger than everybody else's. We're all in this together. We are in a global economy, whether you like it or not. Everything that's done is on a global scale. Uh, a lot of the items you purchase are from a global, a different country globally. And so understanding that everybody has different experiences, they have different backgrounds, they have different cultures and religions, and that's okay, because it's our imperfections as human beings is what makes this life so perfect. Uh, because there's so many things you can learn from so many other people. Absolutely. And, you know, I think you've said it really well there, Gabriel, and we've all got we've all got a set of challenges in some ways. And, you know, it's a matter of how you want to look at at, at those challenges and hurdles. And, you know, life, we all develop in life at different times and in different ways. I'd say I'm pretty much a, a, a late bloomer. You know, I'm I'm hitting my straps now. And of course, I've got to make sure I live longer to, to, <laughs> to benefit and enjoy that. But, but you know, I think that that's you know that's part of the journey, and that uh, you know, for entrepreneurs to realise that we don't all make it after two years or five years. Don't measure yourself against somebody else because you don't know what they're going through, what they had to do to get there, or what the circumstances were. You don't know any. You don't know any of that. It's a. It's. It's about your game. And more stress will come into your life if you start measuring yourself against somebody else and measuring how much you got in the bank, because there's always somebody that's got more. Yes. Yes. Very true. And folks, I got to tell you, it took me about five years for SLM Apparel for me to scale it and then close the doors because I realized I didn't know what the hell I was doing. Right. And that's when I went back to Portland State. Uh, got my business degree, met my wife, went and got my MBA at Syracuse, and then restarted again. Okay, now I have the tool belt with some tools, and now I know how to use these tools. So let me begin to use them. Uh, but you know, at the end of the day, it's, it's getting out there and trying it, trying experience. Traveling is a really good way for you to uh, learn quite a bit. Uh, going to a different country where you do not know the language, you are going to grow immensely because you're going to have to figure out how to do things uh, in a way that you never knew how to do before. And that's a really, really good learning experience. Now, Hugh, you've, you've been doing this for some time. You got a lot of experience. What advice would you give aspiring entrepreneurs or, or, or as you mentioned, those caged up lions? What advice would you give to them? Yeah. So I think the first thing is, is have a big dream and don't, don't sell that short. And, you know, I knew as a child, I had a, I had an entrepreneurial dream, um, you know, to have a global business. I think that have that and then, and then start small and finish big. Don't, don't go and try and fulfill the whole dream at once because that's not realistic. This is a journey stick to your guns on what you absolutely believe in and 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 why you're doing what you do yes there will be business plan a to business plan g at least that uh and 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 then enjoy the ride and you know even when there's a bad moment look at it and say okay what's the silver lining in this what did i learn out of it and you know maybe you hit a wall again i've had a few, you know a few disasters here and there but i, I and bang the head against the wall it's you know, nearly cost me a lot. But every time, actually, I was lucky that it happened when it did. And I saw it and, and, and moved on. And somehow I immediately, I very soon after became bigger and better. And I, I think that's the that's that's the thing with it. But you've got to have resilience to go on on this journey. And and so does the your spouse and your family. Right. Um, they got to come on on it with you. Yes, yes, very true. And making I I could not said it better yourself because at the end of the day, it's 
you might be the entrepreneur working, but it's it's your family that's also a part of it because it's the time away, the time on calls that they also uh, feel that brunt. Yeah, and they fear the blunt, feel the brunt of your moods and mood swings and motions. And so if you don't totally believe in what you're doing and have confidence in the future and believe in a bigger future and that the future is going to get even bigger and bigger um, and you've got an abundant attitude, truly abundant attitude in that, then... You know, it, that will always be that will always be a problem. Very true. And remember, folks, nobody starts at the finish line, right? Nobody starts yeah. and, and nobody's perfect. In fact, the last person that was allegedly perfect walked on water and look how the world treated that individual. So, you know, think about think about that. And again, test things out, test, uh, ask people how things if you, if you have a minimal vile product, Take it out to a road show, take it to a conference, uh, take it to a pitch competition and see if it works before you invest a lot of money to try to scale that business. Because you may find out that that MVP, you have a great idea, but no market for it. So make sure you have a market before you scale. Yep. And don't die wondering. And don't die wondering. Yeah, get out there and try it. Everybody else is trying it. Hugh, thank you again so much for being on the show. Is there any last words you'd like to say before we leave? No, I, 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 I don't really have anything else, Gabriel. I think we've really uh covered it uh, as i said i think don't die wondering um and yeah go out there and enjoy it and um uh, you know live the dream live the dream so we do not have to i love that quote don't die wondering hugh the executive director and founder of dna behavioral international the behavior behavior and money insight company again folks i'll have all this information on the shades of entrepreneurship website and newsletter you can subscribe by visiting the shades of e.com you can also find us on youtube instagram tiktok facebook and linkedin by uh, visiting the shades of e.com or simply searching the shades of e again uh, you can subscribe to this and you, please if those are interested i have a patreon account five dollars a month will help support the podcast which allows me to continue to bring on phenomenal guests uh, for you. And, and again, please do everything you can to help educate each other and stay well out there. Thank you and have a great night.